thank you uh, all very much, and thank the organisers in particular for inviting me. It's a privilege to speak on this topic, and it's in particular a privilege to speak on it here. And um, for reasons that will become clear, some of the key figures of the intellectual story that I'll be telling uh, were based just around the corner in Trinity College. <coughs> so, uh, at home and at sea in an infinite universe, um, it perhaps was always evident to uh, theologically inclined physicists that the universe should be infinite. Um, although I think the story of theological thought anyway as to infinity of the universe um, is a complicated one. Um, but I think there's no doubt that Newton himself believed that the universe uh, was infinite. <coughs> um, and that question d does bring to uh, bring, bring up a number of, of concerns, a number of puzzles. <coughs> um, and these are what I want to go through to today. They are puzzles that directly concerned Newton, and they are puzzles that directly bear on Newton's theory of gravity as it was formulated in the Principia and indeed as it's been formulated subsequently. So, I mean, we look at the starry sky and we see lots of stars. As one looks further, uh, one continues to see <laughs> stars. But, of course, uh, it may be the case that if only we could zoom out far enough, see far enough out, um, that eventually we get something that is reasonably co compact, reasonably localised, uh, something that we can imagine a finite universe uh, that we can perhaps grasp and model mathematically uh, to some schematic approximation, of course. Uh, um, and we could hope that, well, if only we could see a bit further out, uh, everything else would be black and void. But you must be careful what you wish for. Uh, and it could be that the further out you go, um, the worse it gets, <coughs> and no better. Uh, this is our situation. Um, as far as we can see, there are uh, rather uniformly distributed galaxies and clusters of galaxies. <coughs> um, the further out that we see, the greater the uniformity. The further out, the greater the flatness. <coughs> um, so it's rather, it becomes rather hard, in fact, to consider how could the universe be finite if flat. <coughs> well, it could, there are some non-trivial topologies. Um, it could have the topology of the torus and yet be flat. But that in itself would raise some very interesting anisotropy questions. <coughs> OK, so in an infinite universe, what in particular did Isaac Newton uh, think of that? And what did he have to make of it? We know he puzzled over the issue because there is a series of cor letters, correspondence, um, with Richard Bentley, the notorious, infamous master of Trinity College. He wasn't then master. This was in 1692. Um, and Richard Bentley was, I believe, asked to give the Boyle lectures <coughs> and thought to give those lectures addressing uh, the question of the existence of God and reasons coming not, as was somewhat common at the time, uh, consequences of the laws of nature that, as it were, demonstrate the existence of God, but features of the laws themselves that either demonstrate God's existence or require God's intervention. <coughs> um, and one of those concerned the distribution of the stars in an infinite universe. <coughs> and how could it possibly be that the stars were, in fact, at rest? So there was a stability question. <coughs> um, and it's not so different from a rather an obvious question perhaps to ask. The same stability question arises with the solar system, uh, so with finite groupings of stars. But with the infinite case, it would seem that the answers are particularly subtle. One might fall into errors. Uh, Richard Bentley thought, well, let me consult you know, the chief. Uh, so Isaac Newton. Um, and this correspondence followed. Um, and here is what Newton himself had to say. Um, there were various aspects to their correspondence, but I'm just going to cite you one uh, quotation. <coughs> that there should be a central particle so accurately placed in the middle as to be always equally attracted on all sides and thereby continue without motion 
seems to me a supposition fully as hard to make uh, as, to, as to make the sharpest needle stand upright on its point upon a looking glass. For if the very mathematical centre of the central particle be not accurately in the very mathematical centre of the attractive power of the whole mass, the particle will not be attracted equally on all sides. And much harder it is to suppose all the particles in an infinite space should be so accurately poised, one among another, as to stand still in a perfect equilibrium. <coughs> um, and then Newton actually continued, but if so placed by a superior being, then they would continue to remain so, <coughs> and so forth. Newton welcomed the implication that only some divine intervention could have arranged things so perfectly um, that indeed we have an infinite class of pins all standing upright um, on a polished sheet of glass. <coughs> right, so this is the, the image really is, is this one. <coughs> um, some remarkable creative act of enormous precision. This is in fact an image that has been used uh, elsewhere in physics, um, in particular in relationship to the arrow of time and the second law of thermodynamics. Some of you will perhaps recognize it. I think this question of how to achieve stability in an infinite space um, must have preoccupied many thinkers subsequently, um, but uh, it became um, significant and important in the history of physics with another thinker, um, and that thinker, of course, was Albert Einstein. I mean, here's a way of phrasing the problem. <coughs> Let me do it in terms of uh, Poisson's equation. <coughs> so, um, here is, uh, in a single equation, a single differential equation, um, uh, uh, Newton's theory of gravity. Uh, this is the uh, scalar potential. The gravitational field is given by minus the gradient of the scalar. <coughs> um, and one way of phrasing the problem is, suppose we've got a uniform distribution of mass. Is there a time-independent density function that satisfies this equation? <coughs> uh, is there a value for the scalar potential uh, such that for rho t constant, uh, phi is constant in time, and so forth? So we have a static universe. Um, actually, the solutions for this uh, equation are of the form uh, and th this is going to be rather curious we have uh, a somewhat arbitrary point <laughs> our zero we're referring uh, the uh, these uh, radii vector to some arbitrary system of coordinates. So here's my point R, here's a point R0, um, and phi at the point R is then given by this function. This satisfies this equation. Um, and this uh, yields a non-trivial gravitational field. G is then minus 4 thirds pi G R minus R zero. <coughs> okay, um, and because of this non-vanishing value of the gravitational acceleration, um, the density function can't be static in time either. So Einstein, um, involved with his own uh, concerns for a static universe and how to solve field equations for gravity, um, of course, in his case, the field equations for general relativity, uh, notice that, well, one way of solving this problem is if we modify this equation as follows, and then it's rather easy to see that there is a static unit, uh, a solution, namely phi equals 4 pi g rho t over lambda. It's clear that the solution only exists when lambda is non-zero, <coughs> um, and 
if rho is now constant in time uh, uh, and in space, then the uh, Laplacian acting on this just gives zero and this equation is satisfied. <coughs> Lambda, of course, is the cosmological constant. I'd like you to try to recall Newton's words, how extraordinary it would be to achieve such a balancing act. In a sense, what these equations show is that there can be no balancing act at all. What this equation shows is, yes, there could be a balancing act. <coughs> if rho is exactly uniform constant in space, um, given the existence of the cosmological constant. But what a curious idea that that kind of balancing act is something that nature uh, could actually produce. Um, here's a judgment from a lovely paper by um, Francesca Bianchi, who's here, um, and Carlo Rovelli, <coughs> commenting on Newton's introduction of the cosmological constant here. Uh, Newton himself called it the biggest blunder of my life. Very often people think, oh, that's because had he not introduced it, had he not, did, were he not determined to arrive at a static universe, he would have predicted a dynamic, evolving, possibly Big Bang cosmology, precisely such as was discovered through Hubble's observations and Lemaitre's work uh, just a few years later. And that would have been the most extraordinary and wonderful prediction in the history of astronomy. So that's reason to call it a big blunder, but there's another reason to call it a big blunder. Let me put it in, um, in Bianchi and Ravelli's words. Einstein had in his hands a theory that predicted the cosmic expansion or contraction without cosmological constant, with a generic value of the cosmological constant, and even because of the instability with a fine-tuned value of the cosmological constant. Meaning, you only have to tweak the matter distribution in the smallest respect, and the static character of the solution disappears, <coughs> and the universe becomes dynamic. But he nevertheless chose to believe in the fine-tuned value, goofed out on the instability, and wrote a paper claiming that his equations were compatible with the static universe. These are facts. No surprise that he later referred to all of this as his greatest blunder. OK. So these are um, problems with uh, infinitude and the no notion of a static universe. Of course, already with a finite universe, you've got problems with a static universe. <coughs> and actually, the problem I want to point to now already arises with a finite universe. It's a slightly different one, <coughs> uh, but it's more central to the conceptual structure of Newton's theory of gravity. <coughs> and it concerns the nature of absolute acceleration. We're all familiar with the fact that Newton posited absolute positions, absolute velocities, that were in fact not, observ not observable, could not be given any operational content, um, and in, in a sense, this was just a mistake on his part. Uh, and the right uh, quantities that he should have been focusing on, um, apart from relative velocities, is absolute acceleration. Right? And that's what I want to talk about now. <coughs> um, and I can talk about it, as I say, within the context of a finite universe. Let's suppose, well, let's consider already just our galaxy. We're located you know, about two-thirds of the way out. Um, we suppose that, Newton supposed that we had determined what is an inertial frame of reference and uh, absolute accelerations would then be accelerations referred to that as the center of mass of the solar system. But the solar system is located in our galaxy, it's uh, two-thirds of the way out, and the galaxy is rotating. There's a question. <coughs> what about the acceleration of the solar system with respect to, to the galaxy? What ballpark figure would that be? Can we get a, an estimate on what that acceleration is? Uh, Sorry? Uh, well, you're giving me the numbers. How do we arrive at them? Should we just do it from r omega squared? Let's do it from r omega squared. So how, how, what is the sort of radius that we're talking about for, for our galaxy or our location within it? Um, well, I'd, I'd, I'd like to think of it in, in light years, 28,000 light years. 
<coughs> but light years. So we've got to multiply that by the speed of light and the number of seconds in a year. What does that come out to? Speed of light and number of seconds. What is a light year? Let's do it in SI units. 10 to the 16. 10 to the 16 meters is a light year. That's roughly right, isn't it? And what is omega? How often does the Earth go around, the solar system go around the galaxy? When were we last here? How many millions of years ago were we last in this particular? The dinosaurs were, work, were walking the Earth about 200 million years ago. So omega is going to be 2 pi over, so this is about 10 to the 8. But again, we've got how many seconds are there in a year? That's about 10 to the 8. <coughs> and then we've got to take the square of this thing. So we're going to have something like uh, 10 over, oh no, more, more like 100 if we're squaring this thing, over 10 to the 32. <coughs> Um, but we're multiplying it by r, uh, 10 to the 16 times this thing. So about 10 to the 19, should we say 10 to the 20 over 10 to the 32? About 10 to the minus 12 meters per second squared. 10 to the minus 12. We're fine. We don't have to worry about corrections to the absolute acceleration due to our galaxy. They're really quite small. <coughs> of course, you could also ask the question, uh, what is our present acceleration as I stand here? 9.8 meters per second squared, but that's relative to the Earth. Uh, what about the Sun? One can raise the similar question there. The Sun's about seven light minutes away. We know the period, it's 365 days. <coughs> well, that works out at about 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 4 meters per second. So it seems that actually things are fine. One only has to uh, consider local masses the further away you go. Uh, there's really no problem. Uh, the accelerations become minute. Uh, to a very good approximation, Newton was absolutely right. The center of mass of the solar system is an inertial frame. So you might think. <coughs> well, I think some of you will know where this is going. Let's make suppose the universe is large. Let's suppose it's very large. Let's suppose it's uh, much bigger even than the visible. But let's suppose it's finite. Let's continue to use finitary methods insofar as we can. Uh, and let's suppose that wherever we are in the universe, we are not extraordinarily and somewhat magically um, and <laughs> in a very privileged way at the center. We're somewhere away from the center. Well, I'm going to make it the two-thirds estimate again. We're somehow shifted away from the center, perhaps two-thirds out. And suppose the universe is approximately homogeneous. <coughs> now what we can do is we can draw a sphere with ourselves located on the edge, and we can neglect the matter distribution outside of the sphere. Because we know that within a hollow space, within a uniform mass distribution, the gravitational field due to that mass distribution cancels, is zero. What we have to worry about is the matter interior to this sphere. <clears throat> and if we've drawn the sphere, we've chosen some point R0, we've chosen this point R, where we are located. So the mass distribution here will just be 4, five, four thirds pi R, R minus R0 cubed times the density. <clears throat> OK, uh, and we want to have the gravitational force, so we have to divide this by this quantity. And what do we get? I've already written it down. So this is the expression that we end up with for the effective gravitational acceleration at this point. And I said that this is a large universe. It's a very large universe. How large does it have to be before this thing completely swamps the acceleration acting on the surface of the Earth? Well, what is g? 
about 10 to the minus 11 in meter cubed kilograms uh, per second squared. Uh, so rho, what is rho? Well, one atom, one proton per cubic meter. Can we take it as that? 10 to the minus 27. Uh, so how big does this thing have to be um, in order to swamp our gravitational acceleration? It's got to be of the order of 10 to the 36, 10 to the 37. Let's make it 10 to the 40. Suppose this distance is 10 to the 40 meters. Right. So 10 to the 40 meters, that means gravitational field acting upon me is enormously, vastly greater, thousands of times greater than anything that we measure. It's not 10 meters per second squared at all. It's tens of thousands, it's hundreds of thousands of meters squared. That's the gravitational field acting upon me. <coughs> um, and of course, if you go to the infinite case, this sort of method of calculation falls apart. We don't get any determinate answer at all. And I want to focus on the finite case. What the finite case is telling us in a sufficiently large universe is that we do not, we never did, have the slightest operational gri grip on what are the correct, true, absolute gravitational accelerations. And if we don't have those, then we never had the slightest operational grip on what are any absolute accelerations whatsoever. So that would seem to say that the central concept of Newtonian gravity and indeed classical mechanics, absolute concept anyway, this notion of absolute acceleration and with it absolute force, is something we never have any operational grip on whatsoever. So I do take that as surprising um, and concerning. There's something going wrong with our understanding of both Newton's theory of gravity and indeed classical mechanics. <coughs> okay, that's, that's the suggestion and that's what my talk is really about. How to take a different understanding of Newton's theory <coughs> indeed of classical mechanics um, that is not subject to this kind of undermining. All right. Now, it is an historical question I'm asking. I'm not really interested so much in the question of how do we today cope with these sorts of issues. We know how to cope with them, and we know uh, how to do it in a Newtonian or a quasi-Newtonian context. We have a thing called Newton-Cartan theory, and we understand very well how to make sense of gravitational phenomena even within an infinite mass distribution uh, and no matter how large uh, a finite matter distribution. Um, and that method involves, well, one way of putting it in the infinite case, um, one is using the methods of modern differentiable geometry, one has a thing called the connection, and one can split that connection into two parts. Um, one part can be assigned to gravity uh, the other part is the thing that is, uh, in an island universe anyway, um, we can uniquely split it into a part which um, is essentially flat, um, is giving us the gravity-free motions. In an infinite case, that decomposition of the connection just isn't available. So we know how to do this in modern field theory. But I'm interested in the question, well, how could we have been so wrong in the theory that we actually used for some 200 years, uh, Newton's theory, and the theories developed analytically from that by people like Lagrange, um, which did not have that mathematical apparatus and seemed to be subject to this reductio <coughs> that I've just outlined. So I think we really do want to go back to Principia. We want to see what Newton actually did uh, and perhaps have a better sense of what we ought to be saying about the structure of the theory. Now, I come back to the point that Newton actually thought he had absolute positions, absolute velocities. Now, he never had anything to say about absolute positions, but he did have something to say about absolute velocities. He made an hypothesis that the center of the system of the world is immovable. And the point here is that everybody agreed with this hypothesis. You know, the sum center of the world, 
and it's immovable. None of his opponents would have disputed that. But it's interesting that he called it a hypothesis. Uh, this is in the third edition of Principia. There were only three hypotheses in the third edition of Principia. And this is one of them. I think that's telling. Anyway, he then goes on, okay, proposition 11, that the common center of gravity of the Earth, the Sun, and all the planets is immovable. For, by corollary four of the laws, that center either is at rest or moves uniformly forwards in a right line. But if that center moved, the center of the world would move also against the hypothesis. Well, if we go to corollary four, what we see is that the common center of gravity or two or more bodies does not alter its state of motion or rest by the actions of the bodies among themselves. And therefore, the common center of gravity of all bodies acting upon each other, excluding external actions and impediments, is either at rest or moves uniformly in a right line. Okay, so there's the crucial uh, get out clause, excluding these external actions and impediments. But that's just what we can't do. Right. What this argument shows <coughs> um, is that the further out you go, yes, you're thinking that the inverse square law is falling off, uh, so one can neglect it, but there's just more and more stars out there. Okay, inverse square law falls off as R squared for a shell of matter out here, um, but the number of stars in that shell goes up as the square and the two cancel. And then you're integrating over however big the space is, and it's a divergent integral. OK, so excluding the external actions, fine, but one can't exclude them. OK, so, uh, that's, so it's clear why what it, Newton had to say was a cheat. Um, but there's another reason why there's something wrong with that, and that comes with corollary five. The motions of bodies included in a given space are the same among themselves whether that space is at rest or moves uniformly forward in a right line without any circular motion. And it's very obvious from this corollary that, of course, Newton's principles are not going to be able to tell you that the center of mass of the solar system is at rest. In fact, even if there were nothing but the solar system in an empty universe, there would be no reason to suppose that the center of mass of the solar system is at rest by corollary five. Corollary 5, of course, leads us to um, Galilean space-time. I mean, this is the one thing that Newton said in Principia about the whole problem of, well, what about the influence of other stars and so forth? I mean, he does discuss this business that since the stars are liable to no sensible parallax from the annual motion of the Earth, they can have no force because of their immense distance. Uh, and so forth. And not to mention that the fixed stars everywhere promiscuously dispersed by their contrary actions destroy their mutual. So we see the same mistake. It is a mistake on Newton's part in, in making these arguments. Um, but coming back to corollary five, we see the bigger mistake is to have absolute velocities in there at all. Um, and the right thing to say instead in the right space-time structure in view of corollary five is Galilean space-time, not Newtonian space-time. We have to move to another space-time, also sometimes called Neo-Newtonian space-time. Galilean space-time, only relative angles of tangent vectors are physically meaningful. So here we have time is going vertically, space is horizontally. Uh, the ladder-like thing on the right, those are two particles moving inertially and actually with zero relative velocity with respect to one another. Uh, but what the angle of that ladder is, is arbitrary. It has no physical meaning. Um, on the left, we've got two particles rotating around one another. Uh, uh, again, the whole thing could be tilted however you like. That's something arbitrary uh, without physical meaning. The total absolute velocities are meaningless. But the relative velocities are meaningful. And in particular, what we have here are comparisons of velocities at one instant of time with velocities at another instant of time, and for one and the same particle, so if we're looking at <coughs> got a big stick. <coughs> so if we're looking at this one, the velocity at this instant of time of this particle can be compared with its velocity at a later instant of time. If those velocities are parallel, absolute acceleration of that particle is zero. If non-parallel, 
than some absolute acceleration. Okay, so this is, this is Galilean space-time. And here is a very common view. I've put it as almost universal consensus. Galilean space-time provides the ideal arena for Newtonian mechanics. There is enough space-time structure to express Newton's laws of motion, enough to distinguish rotating from non-rotating systems, and so explain the phenomena in the bucket experiment. You know, this is the rotating bucket of water uh, that in the, in the scolium to the laws. Enough to define inertial and non-inertial coordinate systems, but there is not enough structure to define absolute rest or absolute velocity in general. So the embarrassing question that Newton could not empirically answer, what is your present absolute velocity, cannot be posed in Galilean space-time. If Newtonian mechanics had turned out to be adequate to explain all observable phenomena, physicists would almost certainly have settled on Galilean space-time as the correct account of spatiotemporal structure. So this is from Tim Maudlin's very nice book, uh, published last year, Philosophy of Physics. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm raising the question of absolute acceleration and that there's clearly something wrong with Principia if we read it as requiring Galilean space-time. I want to give another reading of, uh, of Principia. And I'm, I'm encouraged to do so by not Corollary 5, but the one that immediately follows, Corollary 6. If bodies moved in any manner among themselves are urged in the direction of parallel lines by equal accelerative forces, they will all continue to move among themselves after the same manner as if they had not been urged by those forces. So this now is, is, is the crucial thing. Uh, uh, and a moment's reflection, I think, shows why this really can solve our problem. Our problem arises. We have the solar system. We have the orbiting planets. Oh. We cannot screen off the solar system from the action of remote masses. That action of remote masses uh, uh, increases without bound the further out we consider uh, their influence. But the further out we consider their influence, whatever else is going on, uh, because the masses involved are so far away, the gravitational field due to them is uniform over the dimensions of the solar system. Okay, that's the crucial point. Whatever they are, whatever their direction, however vast they may be, they are uniform over the dimensions of the solar system. And now from the weak equivalence principle, the weak equivalence principle is going to tell us that uh, all masses in this local system um, are going to respond to the gravitational force in such a way as to acquire identically the same accelerations. It's the claim that um, Ma, where this is now the inertial mass, if the mass times acceleration, this is Newton's second law, is given by the gravitational field, um, then the ratios of the inertial mass to the, the mass that couples to the gravitational field is going to be the same, regardless of whether we're looking at metal, stone, liquid, whatever it is. And of course, in Principia, Newton begins book three um, with his empirical studies of the behavior of pendula, that regardless of the constitution of the pendulum bob, the period is the same, depends only on the length of the string. Okay. <clears throat> so this observation, the weak equivalence principle, was important to Newton. Newton built into Principia precisely the right logic to enable him to use corollary six to conclude that the influence of this gravitational field from remote bodies, whatever it is, is going to make no difference to the motions of the solar system among themselves. <clears throat> okay, so that in, in a way already solves the fundamental problem and it solves the fundamental problem of how to make sense, how to apply Newtonian gravity even in an infinite universe. 
this is a particle theory. One can't write down an infinite number of particle equations. <coughs> One really has to go to a field theory to mathematically model uh, infinity in this way. Um, but what one can do is even given an infinite mass distribution, one can look at some subset of those masses so long as remote from all of the rest. So that needs concrete empirical input. The solar system is extremely remote from any neighboring masses. Just look at the neighboring stars already, seven, eight, nine, ten light years away. So the solar system already satisfies the criterion that whatever the vast forces, infinite, uh, whatever they are, uh, due to all other masses, um, they're going to be uniform over the solar system and therefore we can just forget about them. <coughs> Newton actually said so. He didn't say it in Principia. He said this in a book that he wrote prior to Principia, uh, a kind of an informal version of book three, um, called The System of the World, <coughs> um, which it was never published in his lifetime. Anyway, it may be alleged that the sun and planets are impelled by some other force equally and in the direction of parallel lines, but by such a force, by corollary six, no change, you see corollary six now he's referring to, no change would happen in the situation of the planets one to another, nor any sensible effect follow. But our business is with the causes of sensible effects. Let us therefore neglect every such force as imaginary and precarious and of no use in the phenomena of the heavens. Okay, so, I mean, this is my evidence, um, and I'm afraid I don't have any other, that Newton knew exactly what he was doing, um, but wasn't really prepared to come out and say it. <coughs> now, quite why he wasn't prepared to come out and say it is another matter. But let me say a little bit more about, well, what sort of space-time structure is the right one, then? Because it isn't Galilean space-time, uh, right? If we can really neglect these absolute accelerations, then there's something wrong with the Galilean space-time picture. And here's the way to think about it. Newton's laws say this. So this is a system of n bodies. I'm going to take n to be finite. <coughs> um, and there's a question about what we do with the infinite case. But for the time being, let me work with the finite case. So uh, mk... Let me write it in terms of x double dot. <coughs> I won't bother with arrows. Uh, is equal to the sum j not equal to k of x f j minus x k. <coughs> okay, so Newton's laws. A system of n equations of this form. Let me instead write down these equations, difference equations. Let's have L not equal to K uh, M not equal to J uh, M Okay so let me write, I've written this system as a system of di this difference equations. So there's going to be a half n, n minus 1 such equations, but many of them are not going to be linearly independent. There's only going to be n minus 1 that are linearly independent. And let me add one final equation, which is this one, mj uh, xj double dot is equal to uh, and I'm going to sum this thing also over J, and by virtue of the asymmetry of the force law, the third law, I'll have, for, uh, for every such force expression like this, I'll have it with X and J interchanged, will give me zero. <coughs> okay. So this system of equations, or if I can choose N minus one linearly independent members of them, plus this one gives me back N equations which are equivalent to the system that I started off with. This last one is expressing conservation of total momentum. <clears throat> okay. Now notice 
What are the invariance groups? What are the symmetries of this equation, of this system of equations? Well, the answer is the Galilean transformations. X goes to a rotation, some matrix R acting on X, plus um, a boost, some velocity U, plus a constant. T goes to T plus another constant. So these are the inhomogeneous Galilean transformations. And the quantities that are invariant under them include the magnitude of the relative velocities, includes the magnitude of relative distances, includes the magnitude of the absolute acceleration. <coughs> but now look at this system of equations. I can rotate still, but I can add on any arbitrary function of the time that I like. So this uh, symmetry group, unlike the Galilean group, it's not a finite dimensional Lie group. It's really much more like a gauge group. <coughs> right, we can add arbitrary functions of the time to the, to the RKJs. Okay. Of course, this equation is no longer preserved under that symmetry. So if we can give up this equation, if we can work only with these equations, uh, then we've got a different space-time structure. We have different symmetry groups uh, involved. <coughs> okay, so that is the suggestion, that the correct space-time structure, not just for Newton's Principia, but for the whole of classical mechanics, um, is indeed one whose symmetry group is given by this. And I want to give an idea of what, what that space-time looks like, what, what's going on with this, the key concept, actually, is that of relative velocity. So it's the first derivative of these difference vectors. <coughs> That's the key concept. Let me write it as it should be written. So a limiting case, delta t tends to 0, of r i j t plus delta t minus r i j at t okay so that's the right way to compute the relative velocity oh sorry over delta t yeah now let me write it uh, in the way that we typically do write it and this is the way it should not be written <laughs> Okay, that's our mistake. We go from this thing to this thing. And this thing, to be well defined, requires a comparison, these are vectors, requires a, a comparison of vector quantities at uh, different instants of time. This thing, I mean, let me just do a bit of a rearrangement, and I know that I'm going to you know, there are limits, in, the limits involved here, and the mathematics isn't entirely trivial. This thing, the better way to write it, I'm sort of rearranging now, it's really this, It's really this quantity. Now what this involves is a comparison. This is a direction. Uh, sorry. This is a difference between uh, two points at a single instant of time. And it's being compared. That gives me a vector at one instant of time, the time t plus delta t. And it's being compared with a vector at another instant of time. OK. One spatial vector at one time, 
compared to another spatial vector at another time. In contrast to uh, a comparison of uh, uh, that takes place across two intervals of time, um, which really needs, I mean, actually what this thing is really giving you is an absolute velocity minus another absolute velocity. You think you're dealing with that appropriately by subtracting one absolute velocity from another, thereby just getting a relative velocity <coughs> invariant under boosts. <coughs> um, but what you're building in in order to do that, to characterize that, is the notion of a comparison of a velocity at one time with a velocity at another. And once you've got the comparison of a velocity at one time of a single particle with a velocity at another time, you need the absolute acceleration. Whereas with this, all you need is the comparison of a spatial direction at one time with a spatial direction at another time. So if I were to go back to this diagram, it's these vectors that we lose. Any notion of vectors of this form that can be compared with one another, all that's needed are these spatial directions that can be compared with one another as to their relative orientation. <coughs> And if you think back to that standard problem that people always worried about, namely rotations, how do you make sense of rotations? The answer is a rotation involves relative velocities of particles, this particle relative to this, the relative velocity given the right way in this way. So a comparison of a direction at one time, a spatial direction at one time, that's at time t, and here's a spatial direction at time t plus delta t. So one's comparing those two directions. There's no change in the distance, but because the, there is a, a, a relative orientation, there is a non-zero relative velocity. And at a later time, the same thing is true. Here is another non-zero relative velocity. And this non-zero relative velocity is different from this non-zero relative velocity. Hence, an acceleration, a relative acceleration. OK, so I think this insight was um, actually available. <laughs> It was really understood um, already in the 17th century, and it was understood by Huygens. Um, I just would like to give you Huygens' own, you know, a few words of his. True and simple motion of any one whole body can in no way be conceived what it is and does not differ from that of that body. <coughs> That's absolutely correct on this understanding of motion. It is meaningless to speak of velocities or accelerations of a single body. One can only speak of relative velocities and relative accelerations. I long believed that a criterion of true motion is to be had in circular rotation from centrifugal force. For indeed, as to other appearances, it is the same whether some disc or wheel standing next to me is rotated, or whether that disc standing still, I am carried about its periphery. But if a turning from which I considered that circumference is now to be judged to be moved and rotated truly, and not just relative to something, then the centrifugal force acts. But that effect manifests only this. That impression having been made in the circumference, the parts of the wheel have been impelled in different directions by motion relative to one another. So that circular motion is relative motion of parts excited in contrary directions, but constrained on account of a bond or connection. Contrary relative motion then truly obtains in the circumference. So circular motion is relative motion along parallel lines where the direction is continually changed and the distance is kept constant through a bond. Circular motion in one body is the relative motion of the parts. So I do think Huygens understood this um, and this entire perspective that I'm laying out was available not just to Newton, it was understood by Huygens and indeed Huygens on his meeting with Newton um, in the 1690s was hopeful that he could persuade Newton to alter Principia so as to correctly you know, get, over, get over these points. He was not successful. 
Right, so, um, I mean, the conclusion then, you're right, the conclusion is um, Galilean space-time is not the correct space-time structure for um, Newton's theory of gravity, nor for classical mechanics. Um, to get a, if I can put it in very simple terms, if you want to, um, there's no need for an inertial coordinate system as normally understood. Indeed, there may be no such inertial coordinate system. In an infinite universe, there won't be. In a large but finite case, there will be, but we have no idea what it is, and we don't need it. What we need is a non-rotating system. It doesn't matter what its uh, linear acceleration is or how rapidly changing in time. It just has to be non-rotating. And we can get that just through a system of gyroscopes, for example, in orbit around the Earth. That would do it. Or I can just get it from a pendulum in my laboratory. Make it as friction-free as I can, put it in a vacuum. It's going to define a plane of the rotation. That plane is going to be non-rotating. As long as we can screen it from any external torques that will act, and that would do it. We can then refer all bodies that we're interested in to that body, the radii vectors in question, look at those difference equations, solve for those difference equations, uh, and Newton's laws will hold good, just as though we were referring to an inertial frame of reference. Well, I had Marchianism in my title, um, and I'd like to have said a bit more about it, um, but actually I think I can say what really has to be said. Um, the point about Marchianism, uh, I mean, here's another bit of standard wisdom, you know, one can go back to the full Newtonian picture with points of space, but it buys us no explanatory power. Or we could go the other way, try to strip away structure from space-time. This is philosophers' preoccupation with just how much structure do we need in space-time? Do we need space and time as independent entities at all? Uh, but here, uh, Maudlin is asking, it's unclear what either the motivation or the prospects of such a project are. Space-time structure is not directly observable, but it nevertheless plays an essential role. There's no more call to eliminate it than there is to eliminate atoms. So this is a very standard, uh, certainly among philosophers of physics anyway, um, call to realism, as it were. There's nothing wrong with realism. There's nothing wrong with having unobservable entities, even if you can't get at them. Even, and now this is more controversial, if in principle one could never get at them. Okay, so I mean, what I've argued and I hope shown is that um, there's something in between Newtonian space and time uh, and the Markian program, and it's not Galilean space-time. I think it actually addresses many of the Markian, Markian concerns. It certainly addressed Huygens' concerns. But for what it's worth, the Markian program has been driven a lot further in the last 40 or years or so, mainly by Julian Barber and his co-workers. Uh, and Julian has shown how we can actually do without um, even the minimal space-time structure that I've just been talking about. That minimal structure, recall, is that we can compare spatial directions at two different times. We can speak of relative orientation. What Julian has done, Julian Barber has done, is to deny that there is any relationship between spatial configurations of particles at one time and those at another given by some external structure. He developed a method in which the so-called best matching condition, whereas given a configuration of particles at two different times, um, just from the information contained in those two relative configurations, one can work out all of the subsequent motions <coughs> from that information alone. Whereas the space-time framework I've given, I also need the relative orientation. Actually, from the space-time structure I'm using, I need the temporal relation too. Barber doesn't even need that. So there's something remarkable, really impressive, um, just from the point of view of parsimony, austerity, you know, how little uh, the Barber-style Machianism needs. Um, but it does need something that I have shown Newtonian gravity doesn't need, and classical mechanics doesn't need. It seems he needs the entire spatial configuration to be defined and to be modelled in the mathematics. Um, and I mean, the way this goes, uh, perhaps I don't need to put up any equations. Um, think of it this way. 
what he gets out, the allowable motions according to Barber, um, are those of a sector of Newtonian gravity, namely those with total angular momentum zero. That doesn't mean subsystems don't have angular momentum. No, it's fine. You can look at any subset of the total numbers of particles and you find finite uh, angular momentum. It's just that when you add up all of these subsystems, the angular momentum eventually comes out at zero. What if you were just to model, using Barber's techniques, a subset of the particles and just forget about the rest? Well, you lose that prediction. Or, or let's put it this way. If you retain the prediction, just ignore all of the other particles, the ones that you haven't modeled, you will conclude that the total angular momentum of that subsystem of particles is zero. Falsely. Right? Unless you're fortunate, by sheer good luck, there is no reason to suppose that that subsystem will have zero total angular momentum. But using his methods, if you just were to model that subsystem and throw away all of the rest, that would be the consequence. So the suggestion is, and I think this is something that um, Barber and his co-workers acknowledge, it really only works for a universe in which you can model all of the particles, and it really only works for a finite universe because his mathematical techniques are really require that much. <coughs> um, so it's sometimes said it's a prediction of Markian mechanics that uh, the observed distribution of, of st stars and galaxies and so forth does seem to have zero total angular momentum. And it's a prediction, he says, of his theory that that is the case, but it's not. Right. It's only a prediction of the total universe. The total universe is vastly more large than what we see. Right. <coughs> okay, so I think um, that's my final message. Um, Newton is at home in an infinite universe. I think Markianism is at sea, which was my title. Thank you. <laughs>